I'm just saying, there was no USS Defiant Dash J, so, you know. Time to riot, Deep Space Nine fans. Hello, Interwebs, and welcome to my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 5, Die Trying. Such a dramatic title. But, you know, despite the dramatics, I'm going to be giving my spoiler-free general thoughts of the entire episode up front, and then we'll get into the nitty-gritty with my spoilers later on in the video. So, let's start off with the non-spoiler stuff. What did I think of this episode? Well, if I'm being honest, especially after coming off of last episode, which I truly think was one of Star Trek Discovery's best episodes ever, this episode rings a little bit disappointingly. Without getting into too many specifics, because even talking about the specific characters involved in this would be a spoiler, but I have to say this episode relied quite heavily on a conflict that I found to be quite forced between two particular characters. While a lot of it seemed to ring particularly true, especially for Burnham, the one half of this, I can't really mention the other half without spoiling stuff, but it just felt like the show was kind of going out of its way to force a conflict that I felt would have been resolved a little bit easier or would have been a little less um, tenuous as it is throughout the episode, um, in order to try and get to the point that the episode was making. It didn't really feel like a natural evolution or that the situation would really fit. It just felt like it was kind of being pushed along a little bit to get where uh, the plot of the episode really wanted to go, which is a bit disappointing, especially because this season has been very good about eschewing that most of the time, where I felt like the character development kind of mirrored where the plot was going to be going, but the character development didn't necessarily push or the plot didn't push where the character development was going, which was a problem that I saw um, in previous seasons of Discovery, where we would see the plot being the most important thing, and then the character evolution would kind of be dictated by where the plot wanted to go. And I saw a little bit of that tendency coming back here in this episode, which was slightly disappointing. The other thing I will say is, especially towards the end of the episode, as we get into the meat of the actual plot of this episode, um, outside of the opening segments, I did find the plot to get a little bit convenient, a little bit easily resolved, and a little bit messy. Because, and there's especially one moment in the plot that I'll talk about in my spoiler section where I was just confused why the resolution that the show went with resolved any of the problems. I was literally sitting there going, but how does this fix the problem that you're dealing with? So I was just generally kind of down on the plot of this episode in general. I found it to be a little bit forced into getting into the inciting of the plot and then a little bit kind of waffly when it actually came to the main plot of the episode itself. However, I do want to give this episode props because in the actual story itself, there are many, 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 many wonderful small character moments that I thought really rang true and actually got to show us a lot of development for characters that have been fairly ignored on Discovery up to this point. Um, a few of them, get, especially Detmer in previous episodes, have been getting a lot more to do, and I've just been really appreciating that. And I liked seeing that continue throughout this episode. So while I do have problems with sort of the overall general plot of this episode, I think the smaller scale character stuff really saves it in the end and kind of doesn't make it a complete wash for me. I think that there is enough sort of smaller stuff going on here that I really enjoyed. The last two things that I want to quick mention before I get into my spoiler section is one, there are a ton of fun Easter eggs in this episode that I really, really enjoyed. One in particular, which I know will bring a smile to many, many uh, fans' face. But yes, the Easter eggs are a lot of fun, especially towards the top of the episode. And uh, this episode does a lot of expositional heavy lifting um, for uh, a lot of the setup for the later on in the season. I will say that some of the exposition and teases for where this season is going to go were insanely, insanely cool. So in summary, don't really love the plot of this episode. Found it to be a bit forced and kind of weird, but I do love the smaller scale character moments and really liked the setup for the rest of the season. But that's as much as I can really say without getting into heavy duty spoilers here. So if you haven't seen the episode yet, this is where you can get off the dang ship or, you know, don't do that. Hang out, have fun, enjoy my, my voice, my dulcet tones as it were, because we're getting into spoilers. Okay, as I usually do, I'm going to dive into my scene-by-scene -scene breakdown of this episode and then sort of recap my thoughts at the end. So we start off the episode with a captain's log by Saru, which is nice to actually hear him giving a true captain's log for once, and a wonderful little scene between him and Michael Burnham. I liked the moment where he calls her number one and she smiles. It was it was a nice little moment between the two of them. I will say, a lot of the dialogue in this episode felt like it was foreshadowing stuff, where they were always just kind of assuming things that I was like, oh no, those are going to get turned on their head, where they're saying like, oh yeah, I know Starfleet's going to have a lot of protocol, and it's all going to be this, it's all going to be that, and I'm like, oh no, they're certainly 
setting themselves up to be like, everything's just going to be a wreck in Starfleet. So those lines uh, came across as very foreshadowing of something that didn't actually pan out. But I just, I, I felt like I was anticipating like, oh no, they're just assuming all these things are going to be there. So of course, naturally, they're not going to be. And I liked that kind of like weird subversion of that trope. Then we get the scene on the bridge, which was probably my favorite scene of the whole episode, just for my inner nerd self, uh, where the crew goes into the new Starfleet base and we get what I call the science gasm. Oh, yeah. I am so sure the visual effects team on this moment had so much fun. I will say the like actual like distortion field, the like weird like ripple in space, I thought looked insanely cool. Great job on the VFX design. But when they go into that star base, I was smiling right along with the crew. And we all know, don't you deny it. We all know that if we entered in that, we would have the exact same uh, science gasm reactions that the crew had. <laughs> I was just loving them like pointing us like, is that a constitution class? Where's the nacelles on that guy? Where where would the warp car even go? That was just so much fun. I really enjoyed the nerding out. It was so starfleet of these just hyper competent nerds just sciencing out. And we all know we would do it. But my favorite moment of this scene, as I'm sure will be the favorite of many people out there, was when they zoomed in on the hull of one of the ships and it was the USS Voyager Dash J clearly referencing the USS Voyager from Star Trek Voyager. And one of the crew members says, oh, I, I'm curious to hear those stories. Well, let me tell you, there was a lot of weird lizard sex. So enjoy that when you read up on those in the logs. Also, speaking of Jays, where's my USS Enterprise J uh, from en Star Trek Enterprise? You know that one episode? I want my USS Enterprise J. I'm kind of angry about it. It's a huge ship that was like 20 miles long. I want it. I'm looking at you, Alex Kurtzman. Want my USS Enterprise J. I better get it. I'm looking at you. Yeah, Kurtzman. I know you watch. Also, someone pointed out to me on Twitter after I recorded my review that there was a USS Nog in all of those Starfleet ships, which is just so, so wonderful and a nice little tribute to the uh, wonderful Aaron Eisenberg who passed away a year or so ago. Um, so I, I think that was just a nice little loving tribute to him. But then we get Adira, Burnham, and Saru beaming over to the Starfleet uh, headquarters. And again, I was really anticipating like everything's just going to be terrible. You're not going to trust them. And I liked the subversion here of like, actually, no, Starfleet is functioning. It's doing well. They're a bit, you know, prudish and arrogant and, and snobbish, but you know, Starfleet's always kind of been that way. So, you know, kind of normal for Starfleet. So I liked that it wasn't this dystopian, like Starfleet's gone, it's all fallen to crap. Like, no, they still have their regulations, still have their rules. It's still Starfleet. It's just much more condensed um, because of everything going on after the burn. So I liked that it wasn't all doom and gloom, but they were still like dealing with the problem at hand. But Starfleet was still there as a structure. And we get some cool little Easter eggs and references, like obviously Kaminar eventually joined the Federation at one point. And I liked that uh, Saru was sort of heartwarmed by that moment. It was just all these little character beats sprinkled throughout the episode that I really, really enjoyed um, that I want to pay extra attention to because we're about to get into the actual plot here. Because here is where we're going to get into the things that I didn't enjoy all that much. And it is namely the, um, the fighting between Admiral Vance and Burnham. So I'm just going to speak generally about it because it kind of comes up several times throughout the episode, uh, at least towards the beginning here. But I found this to be incredibly, incredibly forced because I kind of understand both points and I understand where this sort of uh, conflict would come out of. Burnham is sort of the gung-ho, I want to get this done, I want to do the thing my way. That just fits her character, it's what we've seen for her for the past few seasons. And I get that that would be sort of rubbing the Admiral the wrong way, especially it's like, you're a thousand-year-old ship, don't come in here and tell me how to run my Starfleet. So it, it makes sense. But for some reason, just as the episode went on and Burnham was kept pushing, it was like, look, we can help, look, we can do this thing. It, it just felt very forced in like trying to get to this point of like, look, we need the Discovery to prove themselves this episode to the Admiral. And so we're just going to shove in this, this medical plot going on where these people are sick. And so Burnham gets all like gung-ho about that and like we can fix this thing. It just kind of felt a little bit convenient in that sense. And then just a lot of the moments I'm sort of like, Burnham would be getting yelled at by the Admiral at that point for, for his thing. And also for the Admiral's part, he kind of felt like he was just being a little bit too 
arrogant and snobbish. It wasn't really a great first impression for him. And it was kind of weird because there was these sort of atonal moments where he would be this sort of like, look, you need to get out of my business. But then you have these moments of complete understanding being like, yes, no, I totally get you. I understand. I will we'll get you through. So it's like this weird sort of like wishy-washy characterization for him that's just, again, sort of felt like it was trying to just push him emotionally where he needed to be in order to be at conflict with Burnham. Um, and so it just didn't give Vance a stable characterization enough for me to get a read on him and just felt like he was functioning in order to get this conflict off the ground with Burnham. And I, I just, it read a little bit wrong to me and a little bit forced. And that's sort of my main problem with it. So I, I don't want to harp on it too much, but it's just a scene because it's going to come up in several scenes throughout here. So just that's my general problem with that. However, we do get a fun little debrief scene. I liked the AI sort of like being up in the business. And I like they saying like, oh, AI has advanced so much uh, since <laughs> since your time, kind of referencing the EMH, the doctor. And, and I like the fact that, yeah, they've advanced, but they haven't advanced all that much, given we know, know how much the bedside manner of the doctor uh, <laughs> was at the time. So clearly their bedside manner has not advanced at all. I uh, liked that little call out. Also, we got reference to the temporal cold war and I liked that it had consequences that it was brought up. Again, I'm loving my Enterprise references in this show. Just mwah, mwah, give them to me. But I also like the acknowledgement of that piece of canon that like temporal stuff going on here would be against the temporal accords and would make their, their coming to this time a crime. So I like that acknowledgement. I liked him sort of like calling out this point. It's like we have two different conflicting um, pieces of information and so I can't entirely trust you. That makes total sense logically to me. The only thing that I would knock it for, and it confused me a bit, is like I would have thought like something like Section 31 or Starfleet Intelligence would keep that information on file to be declassified at this time because Starfleet Intelligence knew that, you know, Star that the USS Discovery went into the future. So while they would have erased most of the records, I'm sure they would have kept one on hand saying, open on this date a thousand years from now. I can chalk it up a little bit to like, there's been the burn. So maybe they've lost some information that they would have had access to at this point. But it did read to me like, I'm, I'm surprised they had no information on the Discovery, even hidden in like a secret recessed vault um, that was like highly, highly classified. Just read a bit forced to like sort of get this distrust going. Again, getting to this thing of like trying to force this conflict in order to get get the plot moving forward of the Discovery proving themselves to Starfleet. But then we get the acknowledgement that Discovery is going to be split up, they're going to retrofit the ship, and that Starfleet's going to basically take control of them. And then we get a really great scene, I actually want to commend this, between Burnham and Saru. While I didn't love the conflict between Burnham and the Admiral, and I felt that that was a bit forced, I liked this scene between Saru and Burnham where Burnham points out her things like, look, we can just go in, we can get this thing, get it done, and Saru calling her on her crap. Um, and saying like, you would just go do your thing and just grab it. Like, no, that's not how we do things. That's not how Starfleet gets things done. I like her calling her out on that. And this actually felt real to me because this is the moment for her to express those feelings with her captain, not the Admiral of all Starfleet. So if, if these moments had just come out here, I felt it would have come across a little bit better rather than her just speaking out of turn in front of her captain to the Admiral and sort of forcing that conflict. But I liked the scene between Burnham and Saru and him calling her on her crap in a more private manner instead of in front of the Admiral. So I will give kudos to that scene. And I will say that it is acknowledged at the end of the episode that Saru does say, hey, if you keep calling out the Admiral, it'll reflect badly on me as a captain, so please stop doing that. So I like that there's an acknowledgement that it does reflect badly on Saru overall, but it still felt like Burnham would have been more self-aware and wouldn't have had to been told that by Saru. It just felt a little bit, again, getting back to that forced idea. Then we get a fun little debrief scene with Jet Reno and Culber. I, I thought that it was just like really funny. Um, and Culber sort of saying like, I'm good with my murderer now and Jet Reno just eating chips. It was just a it was just a fun little scene for all the characters. And I, I, I thought I laughed a few times. But then we get the first of many scenes with David Cronenberg. Yes, that David Cronenberg, the director and Emperor Empress George O. So I'll just talk about all these scenes right up here. I think David Cronenberg does a great job of just being this calm, cool, collected, sort of know-it-all kind of guy and sort of like aloof and analyzing the scene. I really loved all of his interactions with Giorgio and the back and forth that they had with each other. I like the first scene where Giorgio's being interrogated by the hollow shows how smart she is that she can, you know, she can take down these hollows. She just needs to blink at them. She's able to figure this out. She's very, very smart. Um, but then when David Cronenberg finally steps in and uh, like becomes sort of her interrogator, she's kind of thrown off her game. 
he has her number to a T because he has studied the Terran Empire for so long and he knows exactly how to throw her off her game and exactly how to read her. I loved the scene where he said, you're going to lie anyways if you if I answer your questions. And so the only way I'm going to get information out of you is if you uh, ask me questions and I can learn information by the types of questions that you're asking. Uh, just really, really brilliant. I like that he digs at her insecurities of like, Look, the Terran Empire is gone. Everything that you believed in and you kind of like thought was this big important work that you contributed to doesn't matter. It's no longer there. And I like that paying attention to continuity too. I, it's one of those things where I really hate all the like Star Trek haters saying like these writers don't understand continuities. Like they clearly do. They're referencing events from like Deep Space Nine and the Terran Empire having fallen at that point by the, the Deep Space Nine part of the timeline 24th century almost very soon after George O left the Terran Empire in relative terms. It was about like what, like 60, 70 years after she disappeared. So it kind of makes sense. And so I, I just don't get the like, they don't understand canon argument because they clearly, clearly do and reference it quite often and clearly have a handle on even like the minutia of Trek. But regardless, going back to the scene at hand, I just like his little needling at her. And I think that there's this, this wonderful back and forth. And I think this is probably my favorite sort of storyline throughout the whole episode that really works for me. Is just this constant game playing between the two. And for the first time ever, George O not coming out on top, not necessarily being the smartest person in the room. And I give props to both uh, George O's actress um, uh, Michelle Yeoh and David Cronenberg because I think they played off of each other insanely well and then we get the scene at the end of the episode where clearly George O's off in a little ways and I think that that might be setting up her arc to want to go back to the past uh, to set up her section 31 show because we have this we have this idea that she's going to be traveling back in time to get to her section 31 show um at some point by the end of the season. So maybe she wants to go back to try and set things right, rebuild the Terran Empire, something like that. I find that to be an intriguing little uh, plot arc there. So great job with the George O storyline here. But then we get in finally to the meat of the episode, um, which is Saru decides to stay behind to sort of like basically be like the collateral for Starfleet while uh, Discovery goes off to prove itself in order to get the basically the, the cure, the seed sample that they need in order to cure this disease that's affecting a lot of people. And we also get the... the um, the Starfleet officer, Wyla, or Willa, I forget exactly her name, uh, watching over everything and sort of like guiding and sort of judging the Discovery crew. And I liked that when she was on the ship and the Discovery was sort of off on the mission, that Burnham was just at her best behavior and every member of the Discovery was on its best behavior because they knew they were being observed. It felt like a job um, interview or a job moment where you know your boss has come in and they're going to be observing everything you do so you make sure you like dot all the I's, cross all the T's. It was wonderfully portrayed by all the actors that they're on their best uh, behavior and trying to get everything right in order to prove themselves and take pride in their work. Absolutely wonderful job. Uh, and I like the moment where they're going in to grab this ship and Detmer kind of being off her game and not really being at her best because of this PTSD. And so I'm liking this again, this continuation um, from all the previous episodes and this acknowledgement that this PTSD is sticking around. I, I'm enjoying that this season isn't just like saying trauma's one and done, it's wrapped up by the, at the end of the episode, but it continues on and they're all kind of dealing it with their own ways. It's a very emotionally true. And I think if anything, even if I don't like the main plot of this episode, I think that that is a, a very uh, resounding success by not only this episode, but this season as a whole so far that the the show is really taking their trauma and their pain to heart and really showing how it carries through and doesn't just dismiss it at the end of the episode. And so I like that coming across in Detmer here. And I like that Owo is the one to sort of set her on track when she's sort of thrown off her game and she's able to like hear Owo and tap into things. By the way, um, I may have been the last person to pick up on this because I know this was a whole thing in the fandom that I wasn't even aware of, but um, Detmer and Owo? They're totally a thing, right? Like, either they are going to be a thing or they are totally already a thing and are already dating. That just, I can see that so clearly, especially having gone back and rewatched certain moments of last episode and I'm sure in previous seasons, because this has been a ship for a long time, going back to like seasons one and two. But Detmer and Owo, I love it. I'm here for it. I'm finally seeing it. I'm with you guys. I'm shipping it. It's a thing. Um, but great moment for Detmer there. Loved that bit. But then the crew finally goes over to the seed ship, and I liked that this part of the episode was really focused on Nan because the ship was one of her people, and they finally joined the Federation in the 25th century. I believe we've also seen her species in the next generation, so I like that sort of continuing on of their history, and again, acknowledging the canon that they weren't in the Federation during the next generation's time, but had joined by the 25th century. Again, these writers know their track. 
I know, shocker. And But I like that we're getting a little bit of an exploration of her character here and that she gets to finally not have her breather on and it's Culber and uh, and Burnham that get to have their breathers on. And I like the sort of sci-fi hologrammy um, helmets. I'm just assuming that's some tech that they got from Starfleet because they didn't have that last season. Um, but I like that it was just a way to show the actors' faces without them having to wear a mask the entire time. It's sort of a smart just design choice. So I thought that was a cool little sci-fi idea. And also showing that um, that finally getting Nan to you know have a moment for herself and finally get some character development. Sadly, she gets character development right before she dies, which kind of reads like Arium from last season. And they even expressly um, reference Arium that like, hey, look, she got character development and now she's gone. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But I, I'm seeing echoes of this like, hey, we're going to develop a character and then they're gone. Bye. <laughs> ah. But we get this scene where Nan comes upon this hologram and she's sort of entranced by it. She sort of can't take her eye off of it because it just is reminding her of her home. And she's just been so disassociated from everything that they they she hasn't got her home yet. And this just reminds her of that. And I like that that ties into the larger theme of the episode, which was that Starfleet still doesn't entirely feel like home for the Discovery. And the Discovery ship is starting to feel more like home for them rather than Starfleet. And they're still sort of looking for that identity within that. So I like that sort of like big scale idea being brought down to Nan's level here. And I like the moment that we have with Culber here. Culber again sort of becoming the counselor of the ship that we saw last episode and him sort of like poking at her and sort of drawing that out of her. And so I like that Culber has become this like shoulder to lean on in these moments. He's just doing a, I, I, Wilson Cruz is just being such a warm, warm presence throughout this season on the show. But we also get our first hints of the mystery of the season that I'm I'm assuming is going to be tied into the burn eventually, which is Michael Burnham hears this song on this hologram that Tall also was playing. Adira Tall had played on her cello last episode and wondering, like, how could that even be possible? Um, and so that's a really cool way to evoke this mystery. I actually wonder now that I'm thinking about it, because I'm like, oh, I wish we had gotten like subtler hints rather than it being called out here. But now I'm wondering if I go back and watch episodes one, two and three, maybe that song appears in those episodes. I don't know. I haven't rewatched them, but I'd be interested if anyone out there did that work and found if that song appeared in those three episodes, because if it did, that would be a really, really cool, subtle hint. Um, and I hope they did that because this is that's a very interesting mystery that this isn't like this big bad, as they reference at the end of the episode, but there's like this subtle underground noise to the the um, the uh, the universe that is sort of calling something out. And maybe that frequency is what caused the dilithium to explode. Um, and so I, I have many theories on it, but it's just a, it's a cool little evocative piece of the mystery that I'm, I'm curious to see how they evolve that going throughout the season. And that gets brought up at the end of the episode and people don't seem to care other than Burnham, <laughs> which is surprising to me. But I like that sort of evocative mystery uh, set up here for the rest of the season with the burn. But then we get into the actual plot of this story with the ship and this is where I again just do not like and do not completely understand this plot so we basically had this uh family living on the ship they basically die during this moment uh when this basically a pulsar from the star you know shoots out and we learn that in a wonderful scene between Stemets and Jet Reno that sort of shows how effective they are to the Starfleet officer. Thought that was a fun scene. Stemets and Jet Reno always have really wonderful chemistry. I love them. But then we learn that this guy survived because he was beaming at that time. And I like the sort of like he's sort of, you know, unable, to, he's untethered from reality because of his grief. Kind of again, tying into that trauma theme of the season of like the Discovery crew doesn't really feel tethered to anything. So they're kind of like lost in their grief. I, I like the sort of uh, science-y, YNC uh, version, metaphorical version of their own trauma. Again, I, I like how Discovery sort of layers its uh, its emotional ideas into actual science uh, like visuals on this show. I think that that's well done. But the way that this plays out is this guy's grieving for his family, wants to save them, and then they science y and see him really conveniently back by just beaming him again. Um, it was kind of techy teched and techno-babbled. And then he's sort of a non-character. He just sort of like, I'm catatonic for a minute. Michael Burnham goes and talks to him, says, your family's dead, deal with it. Uh, and then they get the cure. It all just felt like rather like, like the like paint by numbers plot, like, oh, we'll go to here, we'll go to here, we'll go to here, we'll go to here. And I, I was kind of bothered by the fact that this moment was given to Burnham to talk to this guy. Well, I get the idea of like, she's able to say like, hey, move on, I, I get that point. I would have rathered it come from Nan. 
Nan seems to be the one that had the character arc throughout the episode. Like, she was the one dealing with being untethered from home. Um, and I would have rathered the acknowledgement by Nan that, oh, yeah, I have to deal with this. And she gets to say this to this guy. And she's able to connect with him through her culture. But she, her talking to him is just sort of reserved for the background noise of a scene while Culber talks to Burnham to do it. It was just sort of an over-reliance on Burnham that kind of... I, I noticed last episode um, where, like, Burnham gets to be the one to go down to the planet with Adira and Culber's sort of the one to say, hey, you get to do it, even though it would make more sense for me to do it. I kind of let it go there because that did kind of read true to me in terms of emotional truth there. Here, the emotional truth didn't really work to me. And again, felt like there's the, the show kind of forcing Burnham into this scene where I think the emotional catharsis really should have been for non here. And it, and in terms of this actual plot of this guy dealing with the grief of his family, he's such a non character that I really am not emotionally invested in him at all. But then they get the cure. And here's where I got very confused. So they get the cure and this guy's like, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here with my family. And Culber's like, well, if you stay here, he's going to die. Okay, got that. So it's sort of like this interesting ethical dilemma of do we respect his choice and his, uh, you know, his culture to die with his family? Or do we take him with us um, and keep this ship alive? Uh, because that's what Starfleet needs. So it's sort of this culture versus the greater, uh, the needs of the many versus the needs of the few sort of thing. Very Starfleety ethical problem. So I'm with you there. I got it. And the way that they solve this problem is Nan stays behind on the ship. So again, going to that, like, all right, Nan gets character development and she's gone. And I guess she's going back to her home, kind of not really dealing with the resolve fact of like, oh, she needs to learn to let go of her home or be okay with returning to her home. It just felt like it was sort of the wrong beat to end on her for her character in that regard, in terms of her emotional catharsis that she needed, I thought her emotional catharsis would have been better fit telling this guy that he needed to get over his family. So that felt off. But I'm also confused by how her staying on the ship solves the problem of the guy not wanting to leave his family and will die if he doesn't leave his family. Because her staying doesn't mean that he will leave now because the whole point is he wants to stay with his family and his family is going to stay there. So why... Would he stay unless, like, her staying means that now he can go on the ship and with his family and they're going to take his family, but why wouldn't they have taken his family anyways? It just, I, I just did not understand the logic of non-staying helping the situation. It felt like I needed, like, a scene where, like, okay, I'll stay and then you can take this guy and his family and there'll be still someone here to take care of this thing. I, I... I guess that that's how that's supposed to play out, but it wasn't entirely clear within the episode itself. And so if I have to sit here and talk it out in order to not be confused, that's a failure of the episode. So I think I got it now as I've talked it out to you right now, but I'm not even 100% sure. And that sure as hell wasn't entirely clear in the episode itself. So I'm going to knock that on the episode that kind of a very confusing resolution to the problem that I even think ignored the emotional catharsis that the show was going for at that moment. So, uh, yeah, uh, it just did not ring true at all. I don't know, but it just did not read like it fit the theme and message of the episode, which was like, we don't have a home yet and that's okay, which is what we get to with Starfleet because non staying on the ship is sir saying like, no, I'm going to go back home. I do have a home kind of goes against the, the rub of the, the episode. But then to sort of wrap up this episode, we go back to the Starfleet uh, headquarters and they sort of have saved the day. Discoveries proved themselves to Starfleet. They've earned their trust there. Again, a little bit forced, I felt. Um, but I, I get the point that they were going for. Um, but then we get a really nice scene with Saru and Admiral Vance. I like this sort of uh, referencing the the Renaissance painter uh, from way back on Earth and saying like, hey, look, they needed someone to sort of see differently in order to get them out of the Dark Ages. And that way Discovery can be for Starfleet. Kind of speaking the theme of the season a little bit there. That's sort of the writers being like, hey, if you didn't get the theme of the season, here it is. Um, but I thought it was sort of evocatively done. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, it's a bit on the nose, but I thought it was well done. Um, sort of moment between Saru and Vance and sort of sets us off for what the crew of uh, the Discovery is going to be doing for the rest of the season. So sort of ends this chapter of this part of the season, this sort of chapter one. And now we're getting into chapter two.
And then we get a nice little scene again with uh, Saru and Burnham. I like this sort of note to end on where he again kind of calls Burnham on her on her crap and says, hey, you can't talk to the Admiral like that. You need to do better. Um, and sort of uh, this something that I think a lot of people in the audience were wanting to say is like, come on, Burnham, get over yourself. You need to start respecting Starfleet. That's what got you in trouble in season one. I liked him calling her out on it. It felt true to Burnham. It felt true to him that he would call her out on it and it sort of showed them learning. I just wish it hadn't come out in such a egregious conflict that felt very forced but the moment rang true between the two of them so i like the moments between saru and burnham i do not like the moments between burnham and the admiral so that's sort of my take on it but a uh, nice little moment to end on so overall messy episode but a lot of small moments that i really think worked for me but the plot of this episode just i i think did not work at all and was just honestly rather confusing and kind of had a weird conclusion that I don't think uh, spoke to the themes of the episode at all. So yeah, that's my thoughts on this episode of Star Trek Discovery, but I want to hear what you thought. Do you think I'm full of crap and that this episode was great? Are you angry that we didn't get the Enterprise J? Because uh, I'm still angry about it. Don't think I've forgotten, Kurtzman. I'd love to hear all that down in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more discussions of Star Trek Discovery and other reviews and other discussions of other things in pop culture. And also I have a Patreon where you can support me as well doing this and helping make this channel greater, but but to beyond all of that, whether you comment, subscribe, whether you help me on Patreon, I'm just glad that you stopped by and hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, especially Catherine Lambeth, Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg Moss, Ashlyn Solstice, Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Chamomile T, Philip Sorbello, Munir Amlani, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Stefan Schuthart, Wellington Marcus, Wayne Twitchell, Buttoneer, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, John Steele, Gavin Robinson, Michael Beam, William Stewart, Nathan Olson, Amanda Ronnie Indange, The Sir Spence, BBD, Hannah F., Miguel Posadas, Jason Knott, Maeve, Andrew Jorgenston, Sabraxis, Jasmine, Chris Brown, Bree Beecher, Nathan Steele, Chloe Dollar, Jane Packard, Dante St. James, Wendizzle Bizzle, Geek Filter, Mark the Edge, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Gretchen Badger, Sarah Bystam, Celestial Dawn, Polly Mina, Din, Jean Mithoon, Lysa, Andrew Lamoureau, Zone One Librarian, Michael Hardy. Thank you, all of you, especially this month.